cost of electricity. I'm going to talk about open source solar photovoltaics and specifically about how to power uh, medical devices in low resource centers. And so I run the free and appropriate sustainable technology group here at Western. Everybody on this call is doing appropriate technology, so I won't talk about that at all, but I will talk about uh, what free and open source mean and why solar might be a, a good option. Uh, so first, why solar? Uh, the main reason is just cost. Uh, this is a graph of the, the cost kind of going back to around when I was born to now, and it's been dropping like a rock and it continues to drop. Uh, today, pretty much no matter where you are in the world, it's the lowest cost of electricity uh, measured by the levelized cost of electricity on a per kilowatt hour basis. And so that goes for powering, you know, universities and hospitals, to small remote clinics to individual devices. Now, why open source? And so this, I think, might be the um, might be new to some of you. Uh, hopefully you've heard of open source in regards to software. Uh, what it means is that software is shared with a license that allows anyone to use it, copy, study, change, or improve the design, and even sell it. And it comes with the source code. And so you probably have seen Wikipedia. That's not only an open source project, but it's run on open source software. Linux is the most successful um, open source software ever. It runs more or less the entire internet, you know, everything from uh, Amazon to, to Facebook to McDonald's use it on the back end. Uh, Android is an open source software package that now dominates the um, smartphone industry. If you have a supercomputer, no matter where it is in the world, it's running open source because it's the best technology available and it's also taking over IoT. So at this point in the software industry, it's very common for us to talk about open source. Almost everybody uses it. Everybody's building on top of it. In hardware, which is what we're here to talk about today, it's, a, it's much more uncommon. And I kind of got my kind of trial by fire and joining the open hardware world because I was working on a project uh, that started out at MIT. It was called One Laptop Per Child. And the idea is you'd have a $100 computer. And this is a little ways ago, more than a decade. And so a $100 computer was a big deal. And they, they wanted to give it to um, you know every kid in every village in the whole world so that they could learn. They had these awesome mesh networks so that everybody could kind of like, if one person could get on the internet, everybody could. Uh, but the problem is the places that it would be most useful also happen to be the places with no electricity. And so um, my team was tasked with trying to find a solution to the problem. And solar costs had kind of come down far enough where you can actually think about having a solar powered laptop. And so the first, you know, it's two up at the top kind of show what it looks like with a commercial uh, solar panel uh, plugged directly into the laptop. And my project was, I wanted to make something that integrated into the, the laptop itself. Something like the, the picture at the bottom where it becomes part of the, the system so that there, there's no you know, solar panel and laptop and all it was all one thing. And I was at Queens University at the time and I finally had access to a 3D printer. And I can't tell you how excited I was because you know with a 3D printer, you can basically make anything that you can think of. And when I went to price it out, the, remember the laptop was a hundred bucks, solar panel was like, let's say under 10, uh, the plastic to do my integration is 65 bucks. And so I started looking around for other ways that I could, could do the, the prototyping of the device and I found this RepRap project. And so this is a 3D printer that can manufacture its own parts. And what happened is it started to evolve technically very quickly because it was released with an open source license into the wild. And so hundreds of people all over the world started to hack on it and make it better and better and better. And my team, of course, was solar powering it the whole time. So our first idea is that we, we would have these 3D printers at schools and you know these the, the top two pictures kind of show our early prototypes and you can see how uh, crude these were in the beginning uh, where they were you know basically full-scale photovoltaic systems powering a 3d printer so that if you could get these in a school um, it didn't matter if the school wasn't connected to the grid they could do manufacturing of say learning aids or things for their, their local communities as we got a little bit better at things and the, the 3d printers continued to evolve we made a suitcase one and so this this one a you know anywhere you can get a suitcase in the world this can power a manufacturing thing that can make all different kinds of things, including uh, medical technology. Uh, but in our own group and kind of with the help of the rest of the world, we really started to evolve on this, the, the 3D printing technology. And so you can see kind of between version one and three, the technology got better and better. And by the time we got to three, that bottom picture is when the light bulb really went off in my head, where we had, I, I did solar research, right? And one of our main sets of experiments is shining different colors of light at a solar cell to see how it will respond. 
and we for that we have this automatic filter wheel changer and mine broke and it was going to cost twenty five hundred dollars to get it replaced with a proprietary one uh, but worse than that it was going to take five months because hardly anybody uses these things and so it was going to shut me down for the summer and of course you know we all know that that's when we get most of our research done and so that was totally unacceptable and so what i did is i got a discarded computer from it put on uh, linux and OpenScan, which is a uh, cad based software package that's run off of scripting. I hired a high school student, and in a couple weeks, I had a 3D printed version of a filter wheel changer that was better than everything on the market and only cost $50. And that's when, for me, it really became apparent that you could use these devices to do real science in the real world. Uh, we also were able to beat the proprietary top of the line, you know, the, the 3D printing company that had, had held the patent for 20 years before we got discontinued and kind of rep wrap took over. So that's what that graph is showing on the right. When we use their materials, we could actually make superior products with it. Um, my group continued to evolve the 3D printers. This is a class that I uh, taught at my former university where everyone in the class uh, had to build a 3D printer from scratch and then make progressively more uh, detailed uh, designs that they could use the 3D printer to make, including manufacturing improvements to the design. So these systems can be built in eight hours and cost less than $500, and of course can be powered with solar. And Jeff, who was one of my PhD students at the time, uh, for his final project made the first solar powered Delta. And so the idea behind this is now you could take a, a bag that you could easily fit on an airplane in the olden days, you could even have a big carry-on, and this would make you a, a manufacturing hub anywhere in the world. Now, since then, we've gotten even more progressively that the, these more progressively detailed designs meant specifically for humanitarian responses. And so this one could go, you know, on the back of a pickup truck, you know, bounced around in the dirt and it will still be completely fine and powered with a couple of solar, uh, flexible solar panels that are a little bit more rugged and can handle well-being. Same with this printer and the electronics within it. Um, and once you have the 3D printer somewhere, you can convert it into a medical scientific tool. So for things like mixing chemicals or filling up 96 well plates, it's very easy to automate it by putting a syringe on top of it and taking your Delta from a, kind of a normal uh, printer where the, the head is printing on the, the bottom to a stage printer where you're moving the stage around and then you can put a really heavy head on the top. And so one thing we did with it was auto automatic fluid handling. Another thing we did with it is to show that you could either attach a USB microscope or use your own microscope to get a, a giant 3D microscope. And so um, if you're doing anything medically related that you need a microscope for, and a stage, this is an extremely inexpensive stage with really high-end um, uh, capabilities that include using open source software or have to do photo stitching and photo stacking. So photo stitching is when you take a big picture and put it all together. And photo stacking is what I'm showing here, where we're kind of zooming in and out and then taking everything in the, the perfect uh, picture and putting it all together to make a hybrid image that has higher resolution at every level uh, within a complex thing. This is a flower petal, I think, that you're looking at. And so when we combine all these things together, this is the way it works. When one scientist designs something, if she shares it with an open source license, it demands that anyone that uses the design has to feed back their designs into the, the open source ecosystem so that then everyone benefits from it. And this cartoon happened in real life uh, where someone made a, a small vial and then lots of people started building off of it to make centrifuges. And so some of them are electric centrifuges that you need power for, uh, like the upper right one and the bottom left one. Uh, the left one is a Dremel fuge, so you can attach uh, a Dremel that you can you know, buy at the hardware store and you can make an ultra centrifuge out of it. Uh, but we're always looking at pushing the power uh, costs even lower and lower and lower. And so how do you make a centrifuge in the middle of nowhere using um, only the device that you brought in. And so that's what the middle centrifuge is about. It's 100% 3D printed. If you have the test tubes, you can make yourself a centrifuge and then you say, well, if I'm spinning down blood or I'm doing some real science with it, how do I know that it's you know actually doing what I think it's doing? And that's when you pull out your cell phone, which can easily be charged with many commercial uh, cell phone chargers. And we apply computer vision to be able to uh, determine that if you know if you had to spin it down for you know X amount of force for Y amount of time, you can get that completely quantified. And so we have the that's completely free and open source software. It works on everybody's cell phone, and you can um, turn waste plastic or plastic plus full of plastic into a medical grade centrifuge. Um, there's lots of other things that you can do with this approach of using an open source parametric design. And so this is the a syringe pump library. It's not just the syringe pumps you see here. It's every uh, automated syringe pump you could ever want. It can be customized for any size of syringe, any uh, power of motor, 
and it's run off of a Raspberry Pi. So if you can connect that to the internet, then you can, it's internet enabled. So you can control it with your cell phone, your computer, uh, tablet, and anything else. And what's interesting about this device is the potential savings that it brings forward. And this is really the reason that I'm so, so bullish on open science. Um, within the first month of us releasing those designs, they'd already been downloaded a thousand times. And if you look at the price of a syringe pump, the cheapest Chinese-made piece of garbage that can't do anything is $150. A good dual syringe pump is over $2,400. And so the downloaded substitution value after the first months was between $168,000 and $2.5 million. And today it's well over $20 million. It's been downloaded 10,000 times. The ROI is in the hundreds to thousands of percent. And the there's new syringe pumps that have been uh, evolving from it, like the one recently printed in Hardware X that has force feedback. So you can do real science with these syringe pumps in addition to, you know, uh, electro spinning or dispensing um, pharmaceuticals or anything else that you happen to be interested in. Uh, where we sit as a community is open source software has taken over. So this is the number of articles published per year as said by Google Scholar. And you can see that, you know, the software is, you know, it's basically saturated. It's tens of thousands of articles a year. Hardware is about 15 years behind. And the reason it's catching up so fast and it is growing so quickly is the economic savings. I did a review of all the open hardware to, to date published, um, well, I guess two years now, um, and it came out to 87% savings. If it uses an Arduino and 3D printing uh, with it, and Arduino is an open source electronic prototyping platform, the savings jump up to 94%. And so this kind of, this is true of all scientific hardware, and I, I think maybe even more true for, for medical hardware. Um, like everybody else on this call, we did, you know, freaked out during COVID too and did a bunch of COVID projects. Um, one was a high temperature 3D printer that can be used to print heat sterilizable PPE. Uh, we also did a, 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 a ventilator like the, the groups uh, last time. Um, and ours, I would say, is the least developed of everybody else's. I would own, like, this was good enough to use in an emergency and the, the university I was at um, only had four uh, ICU beds, and so it was really scary there, especially in the beginning. And then uh, we made this PAPR system for uh, firefighters, and again, it was because there was no uh, masks available anywhere in the area, and the, the firefighters were being used as first responders. We've also been a huge fan of the Enabling the Future project, which hopefully everybody's familiar with. It's uh, using open source 3D printing designs in order to make prosthetics for children. Um, and you know, as the children grow, they, it's easy to uh, reprint and, and kind of resize them as, as they grow. I don't want you to think that digital manufacturing can only do plastic. Uh, we also have open source metal 3D printers, and most recently, I'm kind of most excited about the ceramics. And so we can use the same printers that I showed you in the beginning that cost a few hundred dollars to print um, ceramics that appear to be able to go into the body. So we've, we've kind of done the first couple were on the pure material science. Uh, then we did one that looked at using human bone uh, marrow derived uh, stem cells that looked extremely promising. And right now we're doing uh, trials in, in rats. And if that goes well, then the, the next step is humans. And so very possible within the near future, uh, a few hundred dollar 3D printer could make this say the um, replacement for your jaw if you got in a car accident um, using almost no money. Um, if we can 3D print things for the medical community and the scientific community, we can absolutely 3D print things for ourselves. So we can drop the cost of a photovoltaic system, uh, racking part by around 90% uh, using a 3D printed rack. Right now, solar photovoltaic module costs have come down so far in cost that the racks are actually the most expensive component. And so we've got a whole sub team right now working on open source racks, and this is, this is one of them that's very good if you're in the um, Anywhere close to the equator, this makes a lot of sense. Or if you're talking about a flat roof kind of commercial building, this type of design is, is quite good. Now, for actually designing a photovoltaic system to power clinic or power uh, medical device, um, I strongly recommend my book. And I'm not trying to sell this book. It's free. If you want a copy of it, uh, just go to tocatchthesun.com and you can get a, a, a PDF in English. The French version is like 95% there. We're just working on um, refining it. Uh, the Spanish version should be done next month, and the Mandarin version should also be done next month, and Hindi should be done by the end of the semester. So it'll be in multiple languages. And what this book has is it, it's talking about kind of stories of communities coming together to put, build their own solar systems to kind of get people excited about doing it. And then the second half is all the technical stuff that walks people through uh, what the 
devices are made up of, how you make decisions about them, how you size them, and then how you put them all together. And so I think for those of you that have students that are considering a medical device that might need to be solar powered, like we talked about last time, this uh, will hopefully be a, a good resource for you. Um, it goes, the probably the most valuable components in the book are actually the spreadsheets. And so it talks you through how you determine what your load is, whether it's AC or DC, and then how to design a system in order to meet that load. And so this is as confusing and complex as it's ever gonna get. Uh, this system has battery backup and can do AC and DC loads. Um, almost everything that you'd be talking about powering a single medical device doesn't need to be this complicated. And it also, if you're thinking about making a medical device that's specifically to be solar powered, the way that you design it might change because if you can, for example, keep all of your voltage levels the same, then you only need one um, controller for to run the whole thing. Um, in addition to these kind of basic spreadsheets on how to calculate loads and the basic sizing of everything, we also have some of the more complex spreadsheets. And I'm not going to pretend to go through that math, but this is how you calculate the levelized cost of electricity to be able to compare solar to another form of electricity, maybe a grid with a diesel generator backup, uh, for example. And all of the math is done for you. You just have to put in the input parameters and then immediately spit out the answer. And then the, this is kind of like a representative image of what you see in the book, um, talking about building a real system. So if you're going to use flexible modules like, like these ones, um, they're very rugged. They tend to be a little bit more expensive, but it also gives you some options for uh, mounting them in ways that are substantially less expensive. And so that oftentimes it, it ends up being the, making the most sense at the very end. Um, so to conclude, um, I'm a very, very big collaborator. I would love to work with everybody on this call. And here's a couple ways that we can work together. Uh, first of all, if you have a medical device that you're considering having to power it because you want to put it in a uh, you know, a rural community in the, the middle of nowhere with maybe without uh, good, reliable electricity, uh, we'd be happy to help you solar power the device and to design an open source uh, PV uh, charging system for it. If you have a design that might be possible to be distributed in manufacturers with 3D printing, we'd be happy to work out with you on open source parametric design and 3D printing that device, or if anybody needs any 3D printed parts, and I don't even care what it's made out of, just let me know. Uh, the bigger the challenge you give me, that can kind of work soon project is for me. If you're integrated, if you're interested in getting integrated into open source communities, we can also help with that. And then finally, if the if the way that your device is functioning lends itself to be being quantified using computer vision, I have a very strong computer vision team now, and they can do things that are um, basically magical to me at this point very, very easily. And so if the sensor that you're using could be replaced by a webcam, uh, this might be a, a very good option for you, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that. Everything my group does and has done is on appropriate.org slash fast. It's all free and open source. You can build off of it. You can steal all the code. You can sell everything I've ever done. All the power to you. And last but not least, I'm really, really interested in trying to enable distributed manufacturing of open source medtech. And so we are, you know, North America really held back by how the regulations are applied now. So anyone that's interested in helping um, policy development so that we're really focusing just on the technical parameters and not on all the red tape, I'd be really happy to talk to you and you can, can reach, me, reach me at the email below. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And I will stop now. The next.